All right, Sean, welcome. Thank you. You've been on the ground and helping out in North Carolina for a couple weeks now. First encountered the story when we did a space live, and it felt like we were a little late to the action then, but it seems like uh, the story just continues to develop, and obviously they still need a lot of help there in North Carolina. What can you do uh, to help catch me up to the situation? What's going on now, Sean? Well, basically, I just want to show you behind me. Like, we're a long ways from being recovered down here. I mean, it looks like it did day one. Um, you know, it, I mean, you can look behind me over here. These businesses are just not rebuilding. And uh, part of that is a lot of these people didn't have flood insurance. And so when you lose everything, how do you afford to clean up the mess? So... I don't know who's going to come clean this up when your whole livelihood, everything you own is washed down the river. And so it's definitely an issue. And I think that's what the problem is, is there's no money. There's no insurance paying anything out. And where do you come up out of pocket to start cleaning up something like that? You know what I mean? So um, it's just very slow progress up here. And there's just, there's no FEMA. There's just a, it's just like there's nothing getting done. So from your point of view, this is all just basically good Samaritans, uh, individual people on the ground that can and do have the means to help out. And, and, and that's basically it, it seems like. I mean, Samaritan's Purse, Mercury One, they've been – some of the big charities are definitely here and working. I've seen a lot of Samaritan Purse um, locations up and down the road here giving out water and food. Uh, Samaritan's Purse is clearly here for the long haul. Um, I see a lot of contractors here. Um, and, you know, I just, again, I think the biggest issue is, you know, again, I'm going to show you this over my shoulder. What do you do when the land that you own is gone? Like, how do you fix that? Right? And um, especially with no funds. Now, this is a place where if we're going to print money, we should just like, print some money and send it here. You know? <laughs> Uh, I hate to be that way, but uh, we definitely need big, big help out here. So what are the, what are the folks who live there? What are they doing now? Are they like out of state and in hotels or have they no. worked their way back to their houses? I'll show you what does what that look like? I'll show you what they're doing. Let's see if you can see it over my shoulder here. Do you see the tents back there along the river? Um, like, right. Not, yeah. what? I don't know if you can see it right there between those trees. Oh, there we go. There we okay. go. You see right, right in there. There's just a tent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what they're doing. They're living in, you know, $49 Walmart camping tents. That's not everybody. But the fact that even one person is living in a camping tent, uh, in my mind, three weeks later is unacceptable. It is cold up here. Today is beautiful, thank God. But it is going to get brutally cold up here. I see a lot of RVs popping up and down the road. Um, so a lot of RVs are coming in from some of these RV charities. But there's still people living in $50 Walmart tents. Is it food, supplies, uh, heavy equipment? What is it that if there was money that it needs to be spent on right now, Sean? Uh, so... Food and supplies have been pretty good, water and food. It's just the heavy equipment, getting this stuff hauled out of here. Where do you put all this junk, right? It, it costs, right now, like, I do some work on my farm. A container cost me a couple hundred bucks. Single container cost a couple hundred bucks to get out there. And then you pay $52 per ton of debris that you dump, right? So just a little farm project can cost you thousand, two thousand dollars $2,000 to get rid of. And, uh, and here we're talking, I don't even know how many billions or millions of tons of uh, debris. I mean, these buildings need to be completely torn down. Like, look at this building in here. This is not a savable structure. Right? This whole no, building does not look good. This whole building needs to be scrapped. Um, it is, in, if you don't have insurance money to rebuild, you sure as hell don't have re insurance money to tear down and clean up. So my concern is two years from now, is this building just still sitting here, you know? And it's a tourism place and people aren't gonna to wanna to come to places that look condemned. 
So it's just a, it's a very difficult, complex problem that needs a lot of effort. Have you heard anything from the locals about how this has affected their ability to vote? Is this going to play any impact in the upcoming election? Do you think, Sean? You know, um, I haven't been able to vote yet just because I've been busy. I'm going to vote for sure. Uh, people are making their best effort to vote. There is a lot of effort out here to get uh, early voting done for these people. But, yeah, it's definitely going to affect their ability. we got people that can't get out of the mountains to get water. They sure as heck can't get out of the mountains to vote. You know what I mean? Um, and, I mean, voting's important, but when you're trying to survive, it just frankly doesn't matter. Let's just say that's yeah, not what, gotta... what we're not talking about up here is the election, <laughs> right? How can we get this? Can I get a tractor? Can I get a dump truck? Hey, I need a pallet of water. Do we need propane over here, diesel over here? Um you get a Starlink over here. It's I've yet to have a conversation with anybody up in these mountains about policy, uh, foreign policy, uh, the the U.S. debt, you know, anything like that. Uh, understandable. Okay, so compared to when you first arrived on the scene, are things getting better? Is like a lot of the help that was there when you first got there, have they left now and the situation is just sort of like stale? Talk to me about how the progression is going. So the roads, like the DOT did a wonderful job. Um, you know, the roads that they own are pretty, you know, pretty much operational again. Granted, we have a lot of bridges that need to be rebuilt. Um, they've done these culverts and these earth bridges for now. You know, the first big storm we have, they'll all wash out. Um, but people are able to travel around. The private bridges are a problem. Uh, you know, some of these communities have, you know, six-figure private bridges leading into the communities. Those have to be rebuilt by those communities. Um, and that's going to take time. And so it's just a huge inconvenience. Again, talking about getting out to vote. You know, when you got to go through a river to get out of your property, um, that makes it very difficult. So, um, you know, traffic, moving around is much better. Cell phone signals back in most of the places. A lot of places up here never had cell phone signal in the first place. And so, uh, but it's pretty much back to normal-ish when it comes to transportation. There's still a few roads that are just completely washed out, like the I-40 and the I-26, uh, that aren't even going to open until January. And that also impacts things. But you're able, for the most part, to get around. So are the towns are the towns functioning now? Are the stores and restaurants operating? What does that look like? Yeah, so everybody who can open is open. Um, you know, a lot of places just will never open again, unfortunately. Uh, but hotels in the disaster area are pretty full. Uh, the workers stay in the hotels, like the contractors and things like that. Um, and also people, people that lost their houses that have money are staying in hotels or have friends and family that are taking care of them. But there are plenty of communities around uh, this area that are open for business. And I would ask if you could go out this weekend, if you're in this area, anywhere near, you know, five, six hours from North Carolina, find one of the towns that's open. You can go on and find them on the internet very easily and come out here, book a hotel room, come see the, I mean, the, the mountains are in full fall colors right now. Like, come up here and spend some money. Buy a Christmas tree. Um, the towns that aren't affected desperately need visitors. And the people who live in these towns are employed typically by the tourism. So don't feel bad about it. Like, these people need jobs. And I, I know there's a, like, you're looking at what I'm looking at right now going, oh, I can't go up there. But one town over, everything's completely open for business. And the trees are beautiful right now. So the message is bring some tourism to North Carolina and help repair the economy that way. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we need money. And if we're going to do it ourselves, that's what it looks like. Because the, the, the major export up here is tourism. And so but what's the nice part is, is you can give to that and have fun at the same time. You know, plan a lavish vacation, stay at the, at the hotels. Also shop local. The chain stores are going to be fine. Walmart's going to be fine. You know, uh... The, the big chain restaurants are going to be fine. Buy gas at the little franchise. Buy food at the small restaurant. Stay at the, the bed and breakfast. Put the money directly back in the community. Um, that's one way you can definitely help. 
How is media attention, Scott? Are there still eyes and, and ears and cameras on location, or has that sort of like faded off of the map? I haven't seen much out here. Um, it's not a very interesting story right now. It's just a bunch of debris and cleanup. Uh, so the photogenic nature of the story is kind of past. Uh, you know, if I showed you the video of this spot two weeks ago, it looks the same, <laughs> right? So what's the point in coming back here and going, oh, look, it's still destroyed. Nobody, nobody clicks and watches that. Um, so it's just not a lot of media attention. You know, some of the local stations have done a good job of getting me on air and let me tell what's going on and helping keep attention on Western North Carolina. Like I said, we've been weeks into it and it looks, ex the only difference, the only difference in this area right now is that container was under the bridge and now it's on top of the bridge from two weeks ago. It's just a snail's pace up here. So like, what is, what is the mindset of the locals? Are they feeling defeated? Are they feeling hopeful? Um, how do they feel about the progress and the future? I had one guy tell me, uh, I'm working on these, these really nice canvas wood stove tents for people. He'd rather live on his land in a tent for the rest of his life than move to the city. And he's like, I'll rebuild my house one piece of lumber at a time if I have to. Uh, they love it up here. Uh, they're self-sufficient. They're very much individualist and they're tough as nails and they're not going anywhere, you know? And, um, like I said, he'll, like I said, he'll live in a tent the rest of his life if he has to, but he's not leaving these mountains. Have you heard anything about the conspiracy theory that they were trying to push people out of the area for lithium? Are the locals talking about anything like that? What's your sense? Not really. I think your bigger threat is uh, a big investment coming in and buying up this land and turning it into Airbnbs. You know, uh, you know, hey, you lost everything. I'll make you a nice cash offer and put a put a nice Airbnb here because the people with money can come in and buy the land and rebuild. They don't. They didn't lose anything. Right? Uh, so I think that's probably the biggest thing. If you go look at where lithium's at in uh, North Carolina, it's actually not super concentrated up here. There's lithium mines like uh, west of, of uh, Charlotte. And there's definitely places, but that stuff's all well known. Um, I, I think it's, it's just more of a conspiracy theory than anything. Uh, but I do see a land grab. Not in a, like I said, not a nefarious. I mean, I guess it's kind of nefarious, but it's just the nature of the beast. Like, I lost everything. I'm broke. I would love to get sixty thousand dollars for my piece of land, so I can maybe go get restarted on my life somewhere. Um, and then that gets bought and turned into an Airbnb, and we kind of lose the charm um, in the communities up here. And just um, I don't know. That's me speaking. I don't. I haven't seen that, but that's what I would worry about is just big money coming in afterwards, and. Uh, and scooping up a lot of this property. So how long can you stick around and help out, Sean? And what happens when folks like you have to go back to, you know, what they were doing before they went to North Carolina? That's the big scare, right? It's already 90% less people up here. Um, you know, we need the pain to start. Like, that's why we need the money. Because, like, if you've got an excavator and a dump truck, you've got a payment you got a payment on that excavator and dump truck. It's great to come up here and work for free for a week, but that guy's got a family and a mortgage to pay too. So without a lot of insurance money flowing in, those guys can't get paid to do this work, right? And it's not fair to think that they should have to be able to volunteer and go bankrupt helping other people. It's just, the, I told somebody the other day, banks don't take payment in kindness, right? I can't write them a, a, send them a video of how nice I was from last month. They still want every penny of that mortgage. Um, so it's kind of what we're up against. A lot of us that are up here, you know, full-time jobs and businesses are run. You know, I haven't looked at my, my finances in three weeks, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that, that's, a big, that's a big risk because you just can't afford to stay up here forever. When the money does get donated, how does it find its way to the folks that are taking time away from their own businesses and operating their equipment at their own expense? Is that something that Samaritan's Purse is organizing? Does that have to go directly to each individual that's participating? How do we get the money to the right place, Sean? You know, it's been interesting. Um, one of the nice things, I've received a lot of money via Venmo. Um, it's not the traditional route. You don't get a tax write-off for it. I have to be super careful on my end, 
not to get taxed on it at the end of the year. And so we don't really have a good system for spontaneous, unaffiliated volunteers, right? Like guys like myself, technically, I bring in 70 grand worth of Venmo money. The government can consider that income at the end of the year. I'm in a $37,000 tax bill. Um, luckily, I know charities that are willing to help me uh, legally fix that. Not everybody has that opportunity. I do think we need better laws from the tax code for people to spontaneously give, and I should be able to submit receipts without having to go through a charity, and the people who give money should be able to submit receipts that are helping in this, this time. Uh, the tax code punishes us for being generous. They want you to lean on the government. And so I, I think, uh, you know, who, I don't know who you talked to about that, but reforming the tax code for disaster relief would be massive. Because the best way to do it is to give money to someone on the ground that you trust. I paid somebody's car payment yesterday. They were going to lose their car. They were behind a month on their car payment. They got four kids. That's their only form of transportation. I was able to go to her phone. She showed me where she was behind on her car payments. I put my credit card number in and I paid her car payment. You don't have time to go through applying, like you lose your car. And so we just need more agility and the ability to give. Um, and that's what's been great with how we've been doing it. It's just the needs come in. I don't have a board of directors. I don't have any rules. You just get to go out and do, and it's ultra fast. Um, but I think for the recovery, that's where the big boys show up, like Samaritan's Purse and uh, Mercury One. Mercury One has been amazing, by the way. I'm like, hey, JP, I need 100 generators. He's like, they'll be there tomorrow. You know, hey, JP, this place needs 100 grand to keep these kids uh, working the distribution center. And he's like, I'll wire it tomorrow. So he's working. Mercury One works at such a rapid pace because it's just a handful of individuals making the decisions. So um, Samaritan's Purse also, they just have such a massive presence um, that they're doing, like the work they're doing is so needed. Just handing out water right down the street. They have tanks and tanks of water. People are lined up filling up water jugs. So without Samaritan's Purse, there would be no water on this road in Swannanoa, right? It just wouldn't be here. Um, and there's not another place to get water in Swannanoa right now. Wow. So, Sean, are you still accepting Venmo donations? How do we help out? Yeah, so, I mean, if you guys give it, I spend it. That's just what it boils down to. Um, there's needs every day. I just came up here with a truckload of uh, over 100 heaters, uh, cook sets, uh, camp stoves. And, uh, we raised over $10,000 with the medical gear. I just literally handed an EMS guy three O2 regulators and a brand new EMS kit because he's depleted his. Um, so we bas I basically roll around in my truck and trailer, load it up with the stuff they're asking for, and then go and make these strategic drop-offs. Um, it's in the – if you look on my bio on my X page, you'll see it right there. It's Venmo. Um, that's the easiest way. And, again, it just all gets spent right back out here. Awesome. I'll make sure that the – the QR code for the Venmo is in the video and in the comments too, so that anyone can donate. What about aside from money? Is there anything that money can't buy that people could help, uh, you know, donate or bring to the cause? I think we go back to tourism, right? It, it, they're sending money to guys like me that are doing work on the ground, but we have the whole level of people who are doing okay, kind of. And so, like, the guys that are destitute, living in tents, we're on it, right? We're helping them. But it's that, it's that small business owner one town over. It's not sure if he can make payroll next month. He's not sure if he's going to be buying kids for Christmas this year. Um, the tourism comes in and naturally injects cash into the system that helps everyone. Um, and so that's my concern is we're helping the most needy right now. Why well, you got a father of four that owns a restaurant wondering if he's going to have his business in six months, you know? So I think that tourism coming in, fly into Asheville. You can fly into Asheville, rent a hotel and just drive around and see the leaves and just stop at every small restaurant, tip like you've never tipped before. And you're going to naturally put the money back in the economy. We have to recover holistically because if you just pump money into it, there's always going to be people that are missed. And obviously the free market is the best way to recover. And we have that power to, to push that. Yeah, I love the idea of uh, organic recovery. You really got to get that engine running again yeah. so that the community can, can rebuild itself. 
Uh, Sean, what message do you have for everyone aside from getting out and, uh, you know, ha being, uh, having your vacations in North Carolina, donating to Samaritan's Purse? Uh, what else can we do? Make sure you go vote. Um, you know, uh, that's something that's going to be super important. Uh, elections have consequences. Uh, we're feeling some of that right now. And uh, so get out there and vote. Just vote once, though. Don't vote twice. Vote early, but not often. Yeah. Early, not often. <laughs> fair right on, fair elections are the foundation well, of our republic. That, that's right. Well, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk to me about this. I'll try to get it out as soon as possible and get as much help as we can uh, to the folks that need it. Yep, it is. You have a fantastic rest of your day. And thanks so much for helping with all this stuff, Sean. I can't believe, uh, you know, that you're dedicating as much time and energy to this as you can. America needs, you know, strong patriots like you to help out in a time of need. So very much appreciated, man. Hey, I appreciate Love you taking doing. the time. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great right. day, Sean. I'll talk to you again soon. All right. Bye. Please consider donating to Sean Hendricks Venmo to support his disaster relief efforts in North Carolina or follow his whole story on X at The Sean Hendricks. If you don't already, please follow and subscribe to me, Penny2x, on X.